Hello, and welcome to episode 26 of the Bible Q&A with Pastor Stephen. My name is Stephen Pace, and I'm the senior pastor at Decatur Bible Church in Decatur, Michigan. This podcast attempts to answer Bible questions in a clear but thorough manner. If you'd like to have a Bible-related question considered for a future episode, you can email me your question to Pastor Stephen dbc at gmail.com. Again, that's Pastor S-T-E-B-E-N-D-B-C at gmail.com. In this episode, we'll be looking at three questions, so grab your Bibles and let's get started. Now for our first question on this episode, Pastor, is there a way to find out what my spiritual gift is? question essentially is wanting to know, as believers, what area of giftedness do we have? Is there a way to determine it? And such. I think the first place to start with this is, of course, after we have trusted by faith alone in Jesus Christ, every believer receives the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and it's an impermanent indwelling. For example, you see that in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So you can see very clearly there that when we trust in the Lord Jesus uh, for our salvation and so forth, we receive the Holy Spirit, the indwelling, and it's also a seal, a guarantee, and it's until the day of redemption. So we don't have to worry about losing it, and those sorts of things. So having said that, the next place to go to is the Holy Spirit not only seals us until the day of redemption, but he also is involved with the gifting of believers for his purposes and for the glory of God. You can see an example of this in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one in the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. So there, just with that one verse, you can see where it's the Holy Spirit that brings about the giftings that are in believers. He distributes to each individual believer. So every single person, when they have trusted in Christ, receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They also receive a gifting and we'll talk more about that in a second. But you'll also notice that the gifting is not based on the person. The person doesn't determine the gift. It's actually the Holy Spirit, uh, which is also a good reminder there as well. We can't, if for example, say, now that I'm a believer, I'm going to do this. Well, the Holy Spirit may not have gifted you to do that. So that's just a good reminder It's also a good reminder that no one has all of the gifts. I think that's important as well. So every individual believer is unique, and the Lord has gifted them in a special way. But we also know that no one has all of the gifts, but we have one gift that we can use. Uh, For example, 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, As each one has received a special gift, notice it's singular, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So gifts are for the purposes of the body of Christ, for service, and those sorts of things. Now the question, of course, originally asked is, okay, how do I figure out what my area of giftedness is? I've received the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has gifted me in some way. How do I identify that gift? Well, I'm going to start with there are three lists in the New Testament that give us some general ideas of gifts. Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. And then 1 Corinthians 12, verses 28 through 30, and then Ephesians 4, 11. So those are three lists, and those lists can help you to identify the particular gift that the Holy Spirit has given you. 
Now, my advice, though, as a pastor would be probably a little different than some others. There are spiritual gifts test and those sorts of things, and certainly that's fine if that's what a person feels like they want to do. But I think that there's a simpler approach to it. The first thing is to pray and to read the passages and then pray again and simply ask the Holy Spirit to make it clear to you what he has gifted you in and let him lead you and ask to be open to his leading. Again, we have to remember that it's the Holy Spirit that gifts. Thereby, when we pray, we would ask the Lord to, if you will, help us to see where the Holy Spirit is leading. Now, in a practical sense, how does that work? Well, each person is going to be drawn to a particular area. And so the one thing to remember is it won't be something that is forced upon in most cases. In other words, you won't have to begrudgingly do something. You'll be particularly drawn to an area. So, for example, for myself, always having a love for the Scripture, but I, over the course of time, had a drawing to teach, not simply hear someone else teach. And that's just a general one. You also need to remember with the giftings is they have to be developed. You take the gift of teaching or anything like evangelism or perhaps if you're looking at missionary missionary work, those things have to be developed. So you don't get the gift, for instance, of teaching and then be, and preaching and all of a sudden the very first time you preach you are like Charles Spurgeon, for example. And I use that just as an, as an example. And so the simple thing to do is to take the passages, read the passages, pray about them, and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand and see where he's leading you. And a very simple way is to think at the church that I attend, whether it's at Decatur Bible Church or wherever you may be attending, what are the areas that you are interested in? You might have to try some out. You're not sure. But I do believe if we take the more simple approach, I think the Holy Spirit will in due time draw us to something and we'll want to serve. We'll find enjoyment in it. And of course, the gift will be developed over a course of time. Now, If you'd like to study the topic of the Holy Spirit related to spiritual gifts, a little more detailed, I would refer to you Charles Ryrie's book entitled The Holy Spirit. I think it does a really good job in one particular chapter uh, covering this subject. And if you wanted to study it a little more thoroughly, that would be the resource that I would suggest. Again, that's Charles Ryrie's book entitled The Holy Spirit. I think it can help give you some additional information. But to answer the question specifically, again, what I would suggest is to pray Read the passages in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians, and then pray again and just simply ask the Lord to reveal to you the Holy Spirit's leading. In other words, that you would be able to discern where the Holy Spirit's leading you, what is your interest, what is the area at the church where you feel like you may want to serve, that the Holy Spirit's leading you to, understanding you may have to try it out but also understanding that the Lord in due time will also develop that gifting, if you will. So hopefully that helps. Now for our second question, this is going to be a true or false trivia question. Is there a city named Sin in the Bible? So again, true or false, is there a city named Sin in the Bible? Now, this is a curious question because today, if I were to ask that question, is there something called a city of sin or sin city, you'll probably find an answer or think of Las Vegas. That's oftentimes what it's called is sin city or some variant of that. But the question actually is, is the Bible or does the Bible describe a city called sin? If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn to the book of Ezekiel chapter 30 and verse 15. So Ezekiel 30 and verse 15. Chapter 30 is a lament 
over Egypt. And in verse 15 of Ezekiel 30, the Lord says, I will pour out my wrath on sin, the stronghold of Egypt. This is the title or name given to a particular city. And so the city is referred to there as sin. Depending on your translation, you probably have a footnote, perhaps, or a translator's note in the references or study notes that have a word P-E-L-U-S-I-U-M. Again, that's P-E-L-U-S-I-U-M. That's actually a name of a city at that time in the northeast area of Egypt. It was a northern stronghold in Egypt, and that was the name of the city. And here in Ezekiel 30, we get the answer to the question, which is true. In other words, yes, there is a city named Sin, and it is there described as the stronghold of Egypt in that day. So in Ezekiel 30, verse 15, gives us the answer to the question, which is, is there a city named Sin in the Bible? And the answer is true. And we find it there in Ezekiel 30, verse 15. Now for our third and final question, Pastor, last episode you mentioned Jesus' second coming in Revelation chapter 19. What is meant in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, by the wine press? So again, the question being, what is being referred to in Revelation 19, verse 15, by the wine press? So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to that particular chapter in Revelation. That's Revelation 19. Now, as you're turning there in chapters 6 through 18, what we have is the tribulation period being described in great detail. Once you get to Revelation 19, we have a scene in heaven where the marriage supper of the Lamb has occurred. And then beginning in verse 11... And going forward, you have the details of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So again, in Revelation 19, verse 11, heaven opens and then Jesus begins his return related to his second coming. After describing some details of him related to, for example, his eyes and his head and his clothing, the question comes up, and we'll just read verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So the question is being prompted off of that statement and phrase there, the winepress that he treads on. What is being referred to there? The first thing to remember, of course, is this is dealing with Jesus' second coming. And so the wine press and the treading is being used as descriptive language to describe the very thing you note at the end of that verse, God's wrath. It is the outpouring, it is the finality of the wrath that is coming upon the earth at that particular time related to the second coming. And it's talking about treading the wine press. Of course, this is descriptive language, and if you think of it this way, if you were to step on grapes, of course, they squish, and juice flows, and they splatter. And that is sort of the imagery there. It's describing someone inside of a wine press who is stamping and stomping on the grapes, and of course, those grapes produce, if you will, juice. And so... That is what the description is. I want you to turn, though, if you have your Bibles, because there's another description and revelation of this that I think will be helpful as well. And that's in chapter 14 of Revelation, verses 18 through 20. There you see where the reapers have come upon the earth. And in verse 18, it says, towards the latter part of the verse related to the sickle. Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle, 
to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and such. And you see the descriptions of the blood. If you keep looking, you see where it describes blood and the various consequences of God's wrath and the judgment that's coming. I'm going to read, and perhaps this will help a little bit. In biblical days, grapes were trampled by foot in a trough which had a duck leading to a lower basin where the juice collected. The treading of grapes was a familiar figure for the execution of divine wrath upon the enemies of God. And that comes from Thomas Constable's notes. Now, you also can find a reference to the grapes of wrath in Joel chapter 3 verse 13. And so this idea of the wine press and such is even in the minor prophets as well. Now, interestingly enough, the title, The Grapes of Wrath, if you recognize that title, that comes from a book by John Steinbeck. And the understanding is that the title actually was suggested by his wife, who was referring to an old hymn. You may have heard the hymn before. It's called The Battle Hymn of the Republic. It starts off, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling on the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Glory, glory, hallelujah, and so forth. So there's a, even a reference to it there in that particular hymn. But the point that I want you to see here is the answer to the question is that the wine press there in Revelation 19 verse 15 is picturing the day of coming judgment that will occur at the second coming of Christ. It's the culmination of the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb. But before we conclude, I want us to consider one other aspect that relates to God's wrath, because clearly the Bible teaches the wrath of God that is coming, in particular there with the question at the second coming of Jesus. But of course, I think the question also needs to include as well that there is escape, there is deliverance and rescue from the wrath that is coming. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 10, Paul writes there to the Thessalonians, and he says that they need to wait for the Lord's return. And in doing so, he says, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. It's important when we look at the topic of God's wrath, which is what's being referred to or alluded to with the wine press, I think sometimes we avoid the subject of God's wrath, and I think it's unfortunate. While on the one hand, we can I can understand why that's not a pleasant subject, but God has clearly described to us in his word that there is coming judgment. But one can be rescued and delivered from that judgment, i.e. the wrath, and that is by trusting in Christ. So we need to make sure that we balance out the teaching of God's wrath. We should teach it. God is a God who is holy, he's righteous, and he also brings justice. Sometimes we look for justice to come, and God's judgment includes justice. But we also equally need to remind people how to escape or be delivered from it. And again, that's simply by trusting by faith alone in Jesus Christ, who he is, what he came to do, but also that he'll be returning again soon and we can escape that wrath today, meaning into the future by simply trusting in him. So if you haven't done that, turn to him, place your trust in Jesus alone and be delivered from the wrath that is going to come upon the earth on those who have rejected the glorious son, Jesus Christ. Well, that concludes today's episode be sure to tune in for our next episode. Thank you again for listening, and until then, God bless.